afternoon. Happy Tuesday. My name is Sarah Howard and I'm the Youth and Community Services Manager here at the Daniel Boone Regional Library and welcome to our Zoom room and some bird fun. And today we're happy to have Dana Ripper here. She's the co-founder of the Missouri River Bird Observatory and works for bird conservation and that's located in Arrow Rock, Missouri, if you did not know. Feel free to put your questions in the chat and Dana will get to them at the end but we have timed it perfectly since we all know we're expecting maybe some winter weather this evening even. So we're gonna learn all about what we can do to help our backyard visitors during this weather and perhaps even a few ID skills uh, that we don't know about. So now I'll magically disappear so Dana can share with us all about winter bird action. Thank you, Dana, for being here and take us away. All right, Sarah, thank you so much. Um, I'm very happy to be here today. Many thanks to the Daniel Boone Regional Library for having MRBO again. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I'm with the Missouri River Bird Observatory. Our mission is conservation of birds and really all wildlife and their habitats via science, education, and advocacy. And Sarah mentioned that we're in Arrow Rock, Missouri. We do have a visitor center there that is open during the spring, summer, and fall on the weekends. So hopefully you will visit us at some point this year. Before beginning, I wanna give a big shout out to the Missouri photographers that have submitted photos for seven years in a row to our photo contest, because almost all of the photos that you're gonna see today are from those photographers. Okay, so in developing this presentation for today, which was a great deal of fun for me, um, as you saw from the MRBO mission, we deal a lot with conservation and its various challenges and issues. So this was just a great joy to put together um, because it's just fun and interesting bird information. Um, here in Missouri, we have about 330, 340 regularly occurring species and you can kind of see their seasonality here from this slide how many species are here at various times of year and this is not always as cut and dry as it might seem um, birds don't always follow what we write down in field guides right so we have situations um, like the cedar waxwing that is a resident but it's a very nomadic species and so just because it is here all year round doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to see it in our area all year round and then also birds that are partially migratory, they might um, have different migration patterns based on the severity of winter um, and resource availability. And so this, this gets a little muddy, but um, today we're mostly gonna talk about um, our resident birds that stick around as well as birds that come visit us here in Missouri in the winter um, and typically breed much farther north. So just a caveat emptor here, we can't go through every wintering species today. I think that you all would eventually fall asleep and or be overwhelmed. Um, and so I kind of had to select, you know, what to what to present. And uh, I wanted to go over some backyard birds, some of which are going to be maybe very familiar to you, some of which might be ID challenges. Um, hopefully you'll you'll learn something in that regard and then some of the sort of specialties that we have here in Missouri during the winter season. So I first I want to put a plug in a very, very sincere heartfelt plug for winter birding and learning birds during the winter versus the summer. So right here you see um, a photo uh, of a vireo in a leafed out tree. And it can be very difficult to especially learn how to identify birds during the spring and summer season, even into the fall when the trees are all leafed out. Um, we've got a lot of tree dwelling species that you will eventually hurt your neck by trying to stare up at them and ID them. And I think particularly um, when folks are beginning to watch birds that learning them in winter and particularly in your own backyard is a just excellent way to, to really learn bird ID and also to be able to observe their behaviors a little more readily. Um, spring and summer and fall birding is also wonderful. Um, it's just that it can be 
quite a bit more challenging. And so it's very much fun to bird in the wintertime. So we'll start with a few relatively common backyard birds. I think that most, if not all folks on here are going to know our Northern Cardinal, male and female as pictured here. And so Cardinals of course are resident birds and they, their plumage remains the same all year. The male has that bright red and the female has that sort of tawny color with some, some red highlights to her. I do want to note that when you see the year's young, which you will see any time really from mm, early summer, even all the way into October, you can often tell the younger cardinals because they have a black beak. Um, and when they're very young, male cardinals look very similar to females, but still have that black beak. And then they go into their adult plumage, as you can see here, and then remain looking just like that. A few other of our very familiar backyard species that stick around all winter, blue jays um, up there, of course, in the upper left, and then chickadees. And if you're in the southern part of Missouri, you will have Carolina chickadee. And central to northern, um, you'll have the black cap chickadee. Now, there is a zone of overlap between these two species. They actually do hybridize, and they actually can sing each other's songs. So if you're in central Missouri, um, I'm here in, in Saline County right now, so maybe a little south of us down in Jefferson City, um, they can be a, a real challenge to ID. But if you're in northern Missouri, you can be pretty darn confident that you've got black cap chickadee in southern Missouri, you've got Carolina chickadee. Um, and then of course on the bottom there, the tufted titmouse, another very familiar backyard bird. This species is singing all around my house right now. Um, and we'll kind of talk about a little bit about behaviors here in a bit, but our resident birds that are here with us all year round do appear to be starting to at least establish territories, if not really start courting each other, maybe a little hesitantly, but there's a lot of singing going on right now. Nut hatches, and I would like to note that um, with the exception of blue jay, a lot of these species um, form winter foraging flocks together. So our chickadees, uh, nut hatches, tit mice, some of our woodpeckers are often seen in little foraging groups during the winter time. Sometimes they are joined by um, non-resident wintering species such as kinglets, for instance. So if you are walking around in, in really any type of wooded setting or shrubby setting, um, and you encounter a flock, you might want to take a good look because it's very possible there might be quite a wide variety of species within that flock. So here you can see we have the white-breasted nuthatch on the left. Um, and you can see that funny picture that Emily Burke took of a nuthatch that was trying to get something and kind of wiped out in a bit of a snowbank there. And then red-breasted nuthatch is also pictured here. And the red-breasted nuthatch is a bird of the northern forests, and it comes to Missouri in some numbers each winter. Um, it is an eruptive species, meaning that it can come to our area in great numbers during some winter seasons. Um, so we usually have a few, but in some years they're, they're kind of everywhere, um, and they're, they're very, very common. So this typically, whatever the eruptive species is, and we're going to look at at least one more, um, this is typically due to breeding cycles and food availability in the north. And typically eruptive species are on about a three to four to five year cycle um, where we will have like boom years where there are many of them that come down. So Carolina wren, um, folks may well be familiar with this bird as well. This is the bird that builds their really neat domed nest in your garage, in your greenhouse, in your potted plant, on your porch. Um, they can belt out their song. Most folks describe that song as something like tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle. Um, I just, I find them amazing because they're just, they're incredibly loud and able to, to really put their song out there. Um, this is a species for which winter can be quite difficult and my understanding is that um, individuals that are 
living around human habitation, um, so basically can seek shelter, um, tend to do a lot better during our extreme cold snaps that th than those that live in more natural areas. So here's a favorite. This is, of course, our Missouri state bird, um, the eastern bluebird, very strikingly beautiful species. Um, this is a species that typically is considered like a short distance migrant. So we do, in fact, have eastern bluebirds in Missouri all winter, or excuse me, all year round. Um, but the individuals might be different. So our birds that breed here in Missouri might go further south to, say, Arkansas. Um, Louisiana, and we might get individuals that are coming down from further north. So we might see them all year, but they're not necessarily the same individuals. Um, this is another bird that is um, very much aided by, by us, by people, by providing things like water sources in the winter and nest boxes, of course. Often nest boxes are thought of as breeding structures, and they are that, um, but bluebirds will roost sometimes in relatively large numbers in a box um, in the winter time and, and stay together for warmth. So providing nice clean boxes all year round is a really, really great way to help the Eastern Bluebird. So some of our species look quite different in the winter time. Um, and I think the best example of this is American Goldfinch. Um, this is of course what a male American goldfinch looks like during the breeding season, they get that bright lemony yellow. Um, I've had a lot of questions over the years about where does this species go? And I, you know, I, people will say, I haven't seen them for a while. They just sort of disappeared and they can be um, somewhat nomadic travelers. Uh, flocks of goldfinches can, can travel dozens of miles um, in a bit of a circuit. So it is possible that they genuinely left your area for a little while. However, um, they might still be there and just not looking the same as you're used to during the breeding season. So there's that picture from the very beginning again, and this is called weathering the storm together, which I always thought was a really nice name. Um, but you can see their plumage is very, very different um, during the non-breeding season. So keep an eye out for these guys. They don't look lemony yellow anymore right now. Um, and also keep an eye out for this bird. Uh, this is a pine siskin. It is another somewhat eruptive species. So we have some numbers every year, but some years we get pine siskins in large numbers. Um, and you can see that it's a, it's a pretty darn similar bird. But do note the streakiness of the pine siskin, um, the really more delicate and tapered bill of the pine siskin. And then hopefully you can see my cursor here. Um, they sort of have these, these yellow um, tinges on the ends of their feathers that are different as well from, from a winter uh, American goldfinch. And these species are often seen at feeders at the same time. So it's nice to get a comparison and be able to, to see them both together. Brown and streaky birds, everyone. Um, <laughs> and we'll do some more brown and streaky birds in a little bit, but just introducing the topic. Um, this is one that I think um, confounds a lot of folks just in terms of there, there are just genuinely a lot of birds that are some combination of brown and white with a lot of streaks. Um, so here, I just wanted to give these as an example of very, very different birds. Um, the bird on the left is a brown creeper and the bird on the right is a brown thrasher. And for folks that know one or the other of these species or possibly both, they're very, very different. They act differently. They are incredibly different in size. The brown thrasher is about the size of a robin um, and the brown creeper is about the size of a chickadee. And brown thrasher is one that got its name by kicking around in the leaves on the ground um, with its large legs to scare up insects and, and get prey. Um, and the brown creeper <laughs> literally creeps around on trees um, 
the species will fly to the base of a tree and kind of circle up it in like a very jerky fashion, um, creeping along. And to me, it looks very much like a moving piece of bark. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, just their profile and, and everything about them is quite different. I wanna show a little bit more of a close up of this, of this brown creeper. This picture is actually called camouflage and I think it's a great, a great name. Um, look at how well that this bird blends in with the bark. Brown creepers are here in winter. Brown thrashers will breed here in Missouri, but a few are around during the winter. Um, here at my house, we just had one during that cold snap uh, that we all had in December when it was really, really cold. Um, we had a brown thrasher hanging around near the feeders a bit. Okay, so one of my favorite groups, wintering sparrows, and again, winter is a great time to not just learn individual species of sparrows, but really get a feel for what you have to look at when you're trying to look at a sparrow. I know that this is a group that can be very frustrating for folks sometimes, um, and I can understand this. It took me a while to learn them as well. Um, binoculars are absolutely key. Um, don't Please don't frustrate yourself by trying to identify sparrows without binoculars because it's really, really hard. Um, so a couple that are very common in our backyards in winter times, starting with the white crowned sparrow. And you can certainly see from the picture on the right, which is an adult bird, um, why the species got its name, white crowned sparrow. The bird on the left in a photo that is entitled, it's cold, I'm not mad about it. Um, is a young bird. So these are not male, female. This is on the left, a, a first year bird and on the right, um, an adult uh, after, after hatch year, after second year bird. So just older. White-throated sparrow, another one, um, which you can see that the, um, the bird on the right there, looks kind of similar, right? A little bit, like if you just looked at the head, it would look kind of similar to a white crowned sparrow, kind of similar stripes of black and, and white, but the white throat is very obvious. Um, again, these are not male, female. They are also not necessarily young and old birds. There is the tan morph white throated sparrow on the left and the white morph white throated sparrow there on the right. Um, one, Nice diagnostic feature with these guys too is the yellow lore. Right here, you can see it's it's a little bit uh, less dramatic on the tan morph bird, but it is still there. And finally, as far as really common backyard sparrows are concerned, we have dark-eyed junco, often known as snowbird. Um, and I'm honestly not sure if that's because people are familiar with them in the winter when it's snowy, or if it's because they look like they've been dipped in snow with their, their nice um, white, white belly. Um, there are many different subspecies of this bird. The one that we typically have here in Missouri is the slate colored junco. Um, and we have, you can see, Here's a male on the left and probably probably a female on the right. Sometimes it's a little bit hard to tell, but you can, you can see the color difference between these two and how um, the bird on the right is way more um, tawny washed, brownish, grayish, and the bird on the left um, is much more uniformly dark. So this is a bird I honestly, you all, I almost forgot to put the dark-eyed junco in here. And I think just because they're, they're so common and so familiar to me that I often overlook them until they make their little sounds, which to me sound a little bit like Star Wars guns. They'll, they'll, they'll say pew, 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 pew. And you can hear them doing that around your yard and around your feeders. Okay, so here's, here's a, a couple of species that, um, <laughs> It took me a very long time to really closely observe the differences between these two species. And there are still times when I'm uncertain of identification of a bird I'm looking at, uh, particularly if there's not a female around. 
So house and purple finches, we have house finches on the left and purple finches on the right. Um, it, it, in my opinion, this is a fairly rare situation where the female is actually easier to identify between species than the male. So you can see the house finch there on the left, the female, she does not have this very stark white eyebrow, right? And this very stark white mustache, if you will. Um, the purple finch female is typically quite a bit just lighter and whiter in general um, and is overall less streaky. She still is kind of streaky, as you can see, but less streaky. Um, the difference in streakiness is good to look at on the males. You can see in the male house finch, there's a lot more streaking than in the male purple finch. You can see that he too has this eyebrow and this mustache that is quite a lot lighter than the rest of his head. Um, but that can be difficult to, to really identify. Um, there are, are very stark looking purple finch males where those that eye line and that mustache are very obvious. Um, and there are others, not so much. The other thing um, other than that I've found that of, of, aside from the streakiness um, that helps with identification is really, is really the color. So the purple finch to me, I think of this as raspberry. I sort of think of it as the raspberry finch and house finches are typically more of like an orangey red. Um, that is not totally foolproof. Um, their diet can affect the brightness of their plumage, um, but just you know, taken on average, those are sort of the ID features that I use with these two species. Okay, some of some of our favorite birds. Um, I think a lot of people like woodpeckers. Uh, we have seven species in Missouri. And I think some of these will be familiar to folks. I'm just gonna tell you in a clockwise fashion, the big pileated woodpecker there on the left, and then up at the top, red-headed woodpecker. We have a pair of red-bellied woodpeckers on the right, little downy woodpecker down at the six o'clock location, and then a northern flicker or yellow shafted flicker um, there on the bottom left. So a couple of things I wanted to point out, you can, uh, determine male and female of several of these species. I think a good example on this particular slide is the red-bellied woodpecker. And you can see the female on top there, the red doesn't quite go all the way to her bill and the males does. Um, and that's kind of an easy way to tell them apart. And then of course on the downy, this little bit of red on the, on the back of the head is what differentiates this, this male from females. They will not have that red. Just wanted to point out a couple things about some, some of our familiar woodpeckers. Uh, flickers. Oftentimes, this bird acts in a very unwoodpecker like fashion and feeds on the ground. And when startled up, you can see very clearly their white rump as they are flying away. Um, I think Sarah told me that we had a question from someone prior to this webinar starting about uh northern flickers in the columbia area and yes absolutely um this is this is a quite common bird in missouri um in general uh in wooded and semi-wooded habitat particularly and in the winter time they they do seem to flock up quite a bit and um i'd be curious to hear if other folks have observed this as well but i've often seen them around flocks of robins um all together so again feeds on the ground a lot of the time. And I oh, wanted to point out that redheaded woodpeckers during their first winter of life will not have a red head. Um, they will have this brown head and throughout the course of the winter they develop that jewel red head that you eventually see on the adults. So if you see a woodpecker and you're like, hmm, that looks like a redheaded, but it's got a brown head, that is a young bird. Uh, one of the most difficult backyard bird ID situations, I think, is downy versus hairy woodpecker. They look incredibly similar and you almost never get to see them like this where they are together and um, very obvious in terms of their size difference. 
So one thing I would point out is that the outer tail feathers of the downy have some black spotting and the hairies do not. Um, but one thing that changed my woodpecker life was thinking about it like this, um, that the downy's bill is only about half the length of their head, whereas the hairy's bill length and head length are about the same. So I, since I learned this, and I think it's even when I saw this photo or this, this drawing rather, um, that it really became a lot more clear and a lot more obvious. Our, our one bird, our one woodpecker that winters here in Missouri, our winter visiting red, yellow, excuse me, yellow-bellied sapsucker. Um, this is a bird that uh, I find to be fairly secretive and not typically as um, friendly, if you will, or tolerant of human presence as Downy and Harry, at least in my experience. And I wanted to put this all about birds, you know, website clip in here purposefully because I would definitely recommend Cornell's All About Birds as a source of bird information. So when I was putting together this presentation, I was like, hmm, I don't think I have a photo of a yellow-bellied sapsucker and, you know, I'd like to look into a little bit more about it. And this is where I go, um, is Cornell's All About Birds for some basic bird information. So highly recommended. So kind of getting out of the backyard scene right now, I wanted to point out a few different, um, just wonderful winter opportunities that we have here in Missouri. And one of those is what I just call, I don't, this is not a scientific term at all, but exhibitions of waterfowl. Um, so at times and in, in various places, typically our conservation areas, um, throughout the state that are that are wetland areas, we have these huge congregations of waterfowl, mostly uh, snow geese, and they can look something like this. So if you haven't done so, I would highly recommend trying to scope out and go to a couple of our wetland conservation areas. So um, Eagle Bluffs is one, of course, near Columbia. Over here in Saline County, we have Grand Pass Conservation Area. Um, there's Lust Bluffs as well in, in Northeast Missouri. So, and there's many, many scattered throughout the state thanks to our conservation department. And this is a great place to see these enormous congregations. So I just wanted to show a couple of photos. It's, it's a truly amazing experience to have just like tornadoes of, of snow geese flying around you. Trumpeter swans. Um, this is a wintering species that um, I believe has gotten more common in Missouri throughout the last 10 or 20 years or so. And you can see that the bird kind of in the middle of this photograph um, has a neck band on it. And I wanted to tell you all the story about that. So the neck band um, has, has the code 4M7 on it. And um, a photographer that we know that's up in Sheraton County, so just north of me and near Salisbury, Mark Ramsey, he first took this picture of 4M7, the swan, um, in 2012. And he was able to track down this bird's history because of the band. And it turns out that this particular swan was hatched in Washington State in 2006, but was taken to the Iowa Department of Natural Resources in 07 as part of their swan reintroduction program. And uh, the bird was, was reared by the Iowa DNR and was released in 2007. And so Mark first saw the bird in 2012 and then saw it every winter in Sheraton County um, through 2019. So, the biologist that he spoke with in Iowa indicated that it was actually quite rare for a neck band to stay on that long. Um, they eventually become brittle and fall off. And so this bird may still be alive even now. It'd be 17 years old. But the last time that you know Mark got a picture of it, it was already 13 years old. So this was um, one of the first pictures in 2012. And this is one of the last pictures that he got there in Sheraton County. Um, in 2019. I just think that's a really neat story of, um, you know, a conservation success, a, a good program, 
um, and some citizen science efforts that really resulted in, in data over spanning several years. Just wanted to share this photo um, regarding trumpeter swans. So this is from up in Northwestern Missouri at Lust Bluffs. And I just find this to be a remarkable capture um, from someone who, Eric, who was able to be there during this, this amazing situation uh, with coyotes and trumpeter swans. Owls, another favorite um of many many people i'm not going to go through all of our resident owls um just wanted to point out barred owl on the right and great horned owl on the left and they are currently um pairing up right now and and doing a lot of courtship rituals and um mrbo is having a whole session on owls of the midwest on february 20th um, so we can get you information about that if you want to check that out but just to mention a couple of our wintering owls, snowy owl is one of those eruption species. Uh, there are some years that we get quite a lot of snowy owls here in Missouri. Both of these pictures are, are from Missouri in a couple different years. And a regular wintering bird that we have that is a prairie owl that actually hunts in the prairies, roosts in the prairies, um, it's, a, it's a grassland obligate species, is the short-eared owl really neat bird. Um, you have the opportunity to see the short-eared owl on quite a few prairies in Missouri. I'm most familiar with them with uh, from the prairies around the coal camp area. They are often there. So speaking of prairies, um, I want to mention Northern Harrier there on the right. Um, it is a, a hawk of the prairies and marshes. So this is another wintering species that is a grassland obligate bird, needs prairies and grasslands to, to do what it does, live its life. Um, and then, of course, meadowlarks. Um, a lot of folks are really familiar with this bird. They are here year round as well, and they form small flocks in winter. I do want to take this opportunity to note that our grassland birds are in real serious trouble and as as commonly known and familiar as the eastern meadowlark is we've lost about 75 percent of them in the last uh, 50 years or so so when you see them please cherish them so a phenomenon if you will that i think has grown quite a lot in terms of our opportunities uh, to see certain species is the wonderful conservation success story of the bald eagle and how we have returned our bald eagle populations to Missouri and beyond. Um, this is a picture taken at Grand Pass Conservation Area and you can see this congregation of eagles. Um, this was something that even in Illinois in the 90s, we had to travel up to Wisconsin to see congregations of eagles like this um, and, and, and hope for open water so that they would be there. But now there are a variety of different refuges and conservation areas across the state of Missouri um, that have things like Eagle Days, um, where we go and count and celebrate eagles. I also want to note that eagles, one of the ways they make their living is by being scavengers. And so you can oftentimes check for eagles on the ground. Um, there might be you know, something that has died in a field or whatever, um, but around here in Saline County, at least, we see them quite often, sometimes flying, sometimes you know, perched in a tree, but oftentimes if we glance out into um, some of our fallow fields, there might be something there for them to eat and there'll be an eagle just standing there on the ground. Just wanna point out, Bald eagles um, do not look the same throughout their lives. They are about five years old by the time they get that appearance that we are all used to with the white head and the white tail. Until that point, there are various um, shades of brown uh, throughout their body. So be on the lookout for that. Um, sometimes they're mistaken for golden eagles. You can see um, the beak is a really good, um, ID feature in that way, it is larger and yellower than a golden eagle's beak. Um, you can see too that this quite young bald eagle there on the right does not have the golden eagle's 
um, gilded head appearance. So what do we have here harrying this, this sub-adult bald eagle? We have red-winged blackbirds. These are also uh, a species that can give us amazing shows of great numbers. And you can see, what do we have? What do we have in there with all those red-winged blackbirds? I see lots of red-winged blackbirds, red-winged blackbirds. What are these? Those don't look like red-winged blackbirds, right? But it is. Those are female red-winged blackbirds. Just wanted to point out that they are very different looking for males. Um, the very first time that I saw one many years ago, I was like, oh my gosh, that's an enormous sparrow. What on earth can that possibly be? And I learned that it was a female red-winged blackbird. So finally, um, wintering sparrows in the field. So as you go farther afield, there are a lot of really neat opportunities with sparrows that breed further north and then come here for the winter. Um, we have savanna sparrow on the left, swamp sparrow in the middle, and song sparrow on the right. Um, these have different distributions and ranges. Um, savanna sparrow partially migrates through the state of Missouri, regularly winters in southern Missouri, um, and goes further north. And then swamp sparrow is pretty ubiquitous um, throughout the central and, and southern part of the state in the winter time. Um, and song sparrow is here year round, again, in, in kind of different numbers. Um, but you can see these are these can be tough to ID, but if you get a close look at them, again, with binoculars, you can see some of the differences in these species. So in the savanna sparrow, one of the ID features is this yellow lore, which is similar to our white-throated sparrow, right, that we talked about earlier. Um, the reddish hues and cap and eye line of the swamp sparrow. And then the song sparrow is typically the one that folks think of as having the just the most um, recognizable and obvious dot on the breast. Um, you can see that Savannah Sparrow has it a bit too, but it's um, typically a lot more obvious in our song sparrow. And then I wanted to point out this beautiful guy. This is a LeConte Sparrow. This is a, another prairie resident. Um, golden on the head and a grayish cheek and, you know, some very light stripes. So just wanted to encourage folks, there's a, a we're really lucky here in Missouri to have such a wonderful diversity of sparrows um, and they're, they're really worthwhile getting to know. So wanted to point out that there's a lot of uh, resources available for identifying these birds that can be difficult um, in other species as well, but this happened to come from bird watching. I really liked how it showed the exact ID features um, in a very clear fashion about what to look for um in in these species so i like using this as an example because this is another one that i made a mistake on uh i was on a christmas bird count some years ago and saw a sparrow with a red cap and i was like red cap that's a chipping sparrow but it was a christmas bird count so um they should not have been here in north northern north central actually it was up in northern missouri at the time um, and so I really got a bit of a crash course in the differences between the chipping sparrow and the American tree sparrow, even though what my eye was drawn to first was that red cap and it, I like really wanted that to be the identifying feature. Um, but there's quite a lot of differences here. So we can see that the eye lines are a different color in these two species. The beak, the American tree sparrow has a bicolored beak, right? And the chipping sparrow has a black beak. Um, this spot, so no streaks on the American tree sparrow, but a spot on the chest and not so on the chipping sparrow. But really, you know, it, while anything is possible in the avian world, um, given where I was and what time of year it was, January, early January, in northern Missouri, um, I really needed to be thinking American tree sparrow, as you can see from the map on the right, versus chipping sparrow, um, which was outside of Northern Missouri at that time. So to end up folks, um, we can 
help our winter birds quite a lot. They need the same thing as we all do, which is food, water, and shelter. Um, so there are a lot of different excellent resources out there um, regarding feeding birds. So you can see that often people use, you know, seed mixes and suet, especially in the winter, which is a good source of fat. There's just all kinds of different options. I would definitely, you know, recommend checking out and talking to folks at a local bird store. So we've got a lot of good resources. You know, in Columbia, there's Songbird Station. In Jefferson City, there's Bird's Eye View. Um, in North KC, there's the Backyard Bird Center. Like we've just got some great experts, people that have been not just selling things for our birds, but also our, you know, wildlife biologists themselves, ecologists themselves, conservationists. Um, so there's a lot of different, different resources out there. Um, want to end on seven simple actions to help birds. So this is something that I think has become quite well known um, in our birding community over the last three years or so. <clears throat> this graphic was made by Cornell, Audubon, American Bird Conservancy, and others. Um, when it became clear that we were having enormously precipitous and dangerous declines in our bird species. And I definitely encourage you to check out 3billionbirds.org and seven, seven Simple Actions, and you can see them here. So there's a lot of different things that we can do that really help birds, that help them all year round. Um, in the context of winter birds, particularly, um, I do want to sort of highlight, you know, using native plants. Our native plants are gonna provide food resources for birds on far more of a year round basis than um, exotics will. There are a lot of citizen science opportunities uh, in the winter time. Keeping cats indoors absolutely all year round. Um, winter, summer, doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, birds might be a little bit more, um, vulnerable at times in the winter due to conditions, but fledgling birds are also very vulnerable. So that's really a year round thing and um, making windows safer. So our migrants, um, it, whether they're coming through or whether they're just coming here for the winter, they are not gonna be as familiar with our buildings as our resident birds might be. And they are um, usually more collision prone. There are data to back that up. So all of these are really important things. And then here's some resources for everyone. Um, my organization has done a ton of webinars with different guest speakers and things. Um, just last week, we had a webinar on wintering sparrows, just a whole hour on sparrows. Um, so all kinds of different things you can view there. We have more of those coming up. Um, these wonderful photos are on our Flickr album. Uh, I mentioned Cornell's All About Birds. Previously, great resource, Grow Native, a program of the Missouri Prairie Foundation will help you with all your native plant needs. And I believe that Sarah has or will put in the chat um, more resources from the library. And yeah, if anybody has questions, Sarah, are you still there? <laughs> I am, and it looks like there are a few questions. All Let me right. see if I can uh, scroll back to the beginning here. Um, right, there you are. One of the first questions that I saw was, do very, do, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, do vireos come to feeders, V-I-R-E-O-S? I have, I've seen a bird. Vireo, you got like it. Your first photo a couple times, but I could not get a photo is what the person asked. So they do come to feeders? Um, rarely, rarely. I don't want to say never. There are no absolutes with birds, right? Um, I could see one coming to mealworms, possibly if if people feed, um, you know, live mealworms, particularly, um, possibly suet. I mean, I I've seen warblers come to suet and heard of it. I I'm not sure that I've heard of a vireo coming to a feeder, but it's not impossible. It's not impossible. Doesn't. But they're going to be here, spring, summer, early fall, um, and it's it would be it would be very noteworthy for them to come to a feeder. 
Um, the other question came up, I believe, when you were talking about the lovely bird boxes and someone asked, what about a ceramic Eastern bluebird box here in mid-Missouri? A ceramic. ceramic. Ceramic? I think I've I never, I have never seen such a thing, I don't think. Not for bluebirds anyway. Um, I would, my concerns would would only be how well does it either how well does it keep a temperature relatively stable? Like, does it get too cold? Does it get too hot in the summer? How well does it drain? Um, how well does it keep predators out? And how well does it weather? Um, so folks that work with and, and landlord Eastern bluebirds um, have over decades made some really nice specifications for uh, conservation friendly bluebird boxes. Um, and, it, you know, the, the specifications are things like hole size, drainage, um, roof that deters predators, and then, of course, putting them on a baffle instead of anywhere that a predator could climb up to them. And so I'm not going to dismiss other materials than wood out of hand, but I've never heard of such a thing. And as long as it was safe for the bluebirds, in terms of temperature, predators, et cetera. Awesome. Uh, we had a couple comments. Michael um, had had as many as 1,250 trumpeters at the Riverlands Migratory wow. Bird Sanctuary. Cool. But, but 16 today. <laughs> I love that. Gosh, that's a huge, uh, that's a huge number. That's a huge amount. I can't imagine uh, being in that. That would be awesome. Um, so my, uh, our, our photographer friend there, Mark, that, that, took all those pictures of 4M7, um, he mentioned to me that he hardly ever used to see trumpeters up there in Sheridan County, and now he regularly sees them in the winter during just his commute to work. Oh, wow. Um, so. Wow. Uh, someone also says that they have a lot of Euro-Asian tree sparrows in the St. Louis area. And another question we got is, what are the main characteristics of the sparrows? The main characteristics of the sparrows, they're small and brown and hard to ID. <laughs> we need little color on them. No, they're, um, so as a group, they are, you know, I think we're all familiar with their size kind of, right? They're, they're a pretty small group. They are not completely seed eating birds, but they're not as insectivorous as like warblers say, right? They will feed insects to their young, but um, do have a diet of seeds and fruits throughout a lot of the year. Um, they, one thing that's really interesting about them is that as much as to our eye, at first at least, they, their plumage can look very similar, their songs are very different. Um, so that's a neat thing about that particular family of birds. Um, and I think that, you know, they, they typically have the colors of brown and rust and rufous and that little bit of yellow maybe on, on the lore and gray. Um, and so what you're, you know, you're really looking for like the amount of streaking and the extent of streaking the presence of if there is you know reddish where is that um in comparison to other birds so it's so much fun um another question was about starlings i think it was a question it just said starlings their influence on songbird numbers um starlings are most uh dangerous if you will um most most challenging to cavity nesting species. So they will compete aggressively with woodpeckers for cavities and with other cavity nesting birds if it, a hole is big enough. Um, so that is really a you know major drawback of the presence of starlings um, in our landscape because they are not they are not native. So. Even something like a red-headed woodpecker, which is a pretty darn aggressive species, um, will kind of give up against a starling eventually. Okay. 
Um, someone's saying that they've seen a white cardinal in their backyard and they wondered how common those are. Not common. Get a picture. But not, but not unheard of. Yep. <laughs> yep. And actually, I just, someone from Clark County, Missouri, sent us a picture the other day of a white titmouse. Um, it wasn't completely albino. It didn't have red eyes, but I didn't see any gray plumage or any other color other than white on this bird. So there's, yeah, there's, they, it's called leukism. So they're leukistic or, or alb a true albino is possible also. Um, but it's definitely not, it's definitely not super common, but not unheard of. Um, someone would like you to comment on dried mealworms. Mm -hmm. And then the other question, another question is, should we be discouraging Eurasian tree sparrows? They seem to be taking over. Dried mealworms are a good source of protein. Um, live mealworms are the best if you can swing it, but not everyone, you know, can, that's, that's kind of, bit of a high maintenance situation but people people do it um but i dried mealworms are good i recommend those good good protein boost especially during the winter time great um eurasian tree sparrows um i actually would be interested in hearing folks from st louis comment on that situation i'm not that familiar with that species obviously you know they're eurasian so they're non-native um I'm not, I guess I'm not familiar with how invasive they are. Like when the commenter said that they're taking over, that would lead me to believe they're quite invasive. I know that folks have, or it seems to me from over here on the side of the state that they've been like sort of tolerated because they were not expanding that much, but that they may be now. Um, curious to hear from St. Louis folks. So, I mean, overall, I advocate for the removal of non-native species um, because our native species of, of all kinds face so incredibly many threats that they just don't need one more thing um, if it can be helped. But I but that being said, I, I don't know um, I don't know the ecology of that species around St. Louis at this point. You're also getting a lot of thank yous, but we also have another question about mealworms. Mm -hmm. Are they a safe food during fledgling season or are they better at certain times of the year? I have never encountered any information that they would not be safe during the fledgling season. Because they, I mean, they are small and they're, they crumble. I mean, I think I understand like they're kind of a hard food. Um, but birds feed their young far more big and dangerous things than, you know, than our dried mealworms. So for instance, if folks have ever seen or seen a video of a purple martin trying to feed a whole huge dragonfly to a nestling, that is um, more risky. Someone's asking where they can watch the webinar on winter sparrows. So that is on our YouTube. So on, um, on Missouri River side. Bird Observatory is YouTube. So if you just go to YouTube and put in the search Missouri River Bird Observatory, that was awesome. that should come up because it was quite recent. Um, we're getting a lot of things here. Let's see. Someone was saying they have an old red cedar in their neighborhood, but they've never seen a cedar waxwing. How could they lure them to their neighborhood? <laughs> They're in Kansas City in the northern part of Kansas City. <laughs> I would love to lure cedar wax wings anywhere. Um, so they will kind of follow fruiting. Um, and, but that being said, just because you have a cedar does not necessarily mean they'll show up. Um, they are a, a really pretty nomadic species. Um, yeah, if anybody has an idea of how to lure that particular bird, I'd love to hear it. They they kind of they do what they want and you know within the confines of what they need for their life history. Okay, I've got some other comments. I'm looking for other questions. Um, okay, I think let's see. 
I see one up right now, Sarah. It just says, are you doing a, a webinar on rafters? And Lou, we don't have one scheduled right now, but we do intend to have, so the, the webinar series that I mentioned before, it's 11 weeks and we've done three weeks of 11. So we just have a wide variety of topics. Um, and we're just doing it through March because, you know, in spring people get busy and don't want to watch webinars in the evening when it's warm and um, light outside. And so, um, but next year, next winter, that will be a good, I think, good topic. Oh, to yeah, do. definitely. So thanks for that suggestion. Well, we'd like to thank you for coming and sharing with us and all of the lovely people that were on today. Um, we're, we're past our time, so thank you for staying. Um, as you guys know, this was recorded, so hopefully in about three to five days, it'll be up on our library YouTube site as well, uh, so you can revisit it or point it out to folks that weren't able to make it today. Um, so keep your eyes peeled for other opportunities and have a lovely time uh, with those bird feeders in the next 24 hours. Thanks so much, Sarah, and thanks everyone that came. Really appreciate you.